There's something dangerous out there. Something that can stop you dead in your tracks. Something that can end your career entirely as a musician. And it's injury. Let's talk about how we can prevent it. Let's make sure that we never ever injure ourselves in our entire careers. I'm proud to say that I've never hurt myself playing guitar. Played for hours and hours and for years and years, never had a problem. And I put it all down to a couple of really simplistic key areas. So number one, use a strap. Now, if you don't use a strap, what you will be trying to do is elevate the guitar into a position that fits ergonomically, like to your body, by using your knees, your legs, you'll be bending forwards, you'll be sitting in odd positions, all just to get the neck at the perfect angle to fit your body. If you could do this for me, put your hands like this and then relax and you'll see that your hands naturally sit at an angle. They don't want to flex and be flat. That is a more natural angle. So the guitar needs to mimic, it needs to fit to you. You don't need to fit to it. So having the neck angled up is much better for you. Also, it's better to sit in a position that imitates standing. So for example, the way I'm sat now with the guitar in between my legs, it's pretty much the same if I stand up. Sat down, standing up, it should feel exactly the same, it should be in the same angle. Using a strap will allow you to do that. It's better to have it in the middle. Um, <clears throat> if you find it hard to relax, then here are a couple of pointers that will help you kind of get there. The first thing is we tend to stress if we are working on something that we find we can't do. And when we stress out a little bit, we get tense, we get frustrated, that kind of thing. It's really important to just breathe all the time. Tell yourself that you will eventually be able to do whatever you're working on. At some point, if you keep practicing, you'll get there. So between where you are and there is just time to suck. <laughs> and you just have to accept, almost want, that suckage. And then eventually when you get there and you can play and you can do these techniques, you can relax. But you know that you're going to get there in the end. Don't be in a hurry to achieve your objective. Just enjoy the journey. Make sure, almost like the links in a chain, that your head is upright. Don't lean forwards to try and look at the fretboard. Have a little look and then look up again. Because after all, you want to be looking at the audience. You want to be engaging the people watching you play. You don't want to be staring at your guitar while you're playing your solo because it's not very entertaining. And it's not going to connect you with your audience. Relax the shoulder. So tell it to relax. Relax the elbow. Relax the wrist. Have the thumb in the correct position for the kind of technique you are playing. Are you playing bending and vibrato? You want to thumb up here a bit more. Are you doing lightning fast dragon claw legato? You want your thumb down the back a little bit more. You want to be relaxed from head to toe. You want to sit in a posture that is chilled. And here is a really good test for you. <laughs> if you are ever unsure whether or not you are in a good posture, remove the guitar and just sit as you were for two minutes and see how you feel. So if you're like this, <clears throat> if this is your posture, if I remove the guitar entirely and just imagine how I was sat, does this look like it's gonna give me back pain? It definitely does. <laughs> it's, not, it's not conducive for a long-term solution to being healthy and relaxed. So observe yourself and make sure that you're always sat and stood in a posture that works for you. It doesn't matter how low it is or how high the guitar is, it doesn't really matter at all. It's just about whether it works for you. Stay relaxed, stay chilled, and make sure that you are touching your microphone as often as possible. Hi, is that, hey, is that better? Stay relaxed, stay chilled, 
and just take your time learning the guitar and make sure that at all times you are in a place of kind of zen. <laughs> Let's talk about writing music. This is something that I'm hoping that all of you will want to do. It is the ultimate aim of any poor wielding shred monkey. Um, and it's the most fun that you can have with a guitar man, honestly. Releasing your own music, seeing people respond to it. I mean, at first, you know, maybe three or four people will download it and it's kind of like a nice feeling and then maybe a hundred people. And, and then when you see people covering the music online, it's just an amazing feeling. Writing music is the objective, and I want to give you an insight into how I have written uh, the riffs, the music for Dorje, for Clockwork Wolf and Company, for Monkey Lord, <clears throat> for all of the projects that, I, that you probably know me for. Many years ago, as a kid, I discovered that I'm, I'm mildly synesthetic, and what that means is that I have this interesting thing in my brain where if I look at a painting or a photograph specifically of a kind of a landscape. I, I perceive the image to be sound, to be music. And it's something that um, I, I didn't really understand when I was very young. And then gradually, as I grew older, I realized it, it was synesthesia. It's mild. I discovered it when I went to an art gallery in Holland. <laughs> And I was looking at a painting and I thought the radio was on, but it wasn't, it was in my head. And what I do now is I use that um, wiring disconnect by imagining myself in a landscape and I, I try and bring out the sound that I'm hearing, which is clearly my brain translating the image into music. And it gives me places to describe. And although not everybody will have the feelings of synesthesia. I think we can all describe something that we experience. And really, if you are attempting to describe something that is deeply special to you, it will only affect your music positively. So I wanna give you an example in a riff that I wrote uh, fairly recently for Dorje's forthcoming album. By the time this is out, maybe the album's already out, I don't know. Um, <laughs> and the track doesn't even have a name. I was really into Game of Thrones. And there's a particular scene where, I don't want to spoil it, but there's a giant attacking this massive ice wall. And for me, it was the most epic thing I had seen in years. This giant, huge creature running towards an ice wall, trying to break it down. A warfare, massive landscape. And I think it's the big landscape that really set off my synesthesia. Which, by the way, is why Monkey Lord's Chromatic Aberration, each track is set within a landscape, because for me, that made it easy to imagine and describe from the inside out, which incidentally is how I also write my lyrics. Anyway, giant running towards an ice wall. I put myself in that place, and I thought, hmm, it needs big intervallics, a big step. I'm pretty much always tuned to drop D or uh, drop C for Dorje. So I came up with this. <laughs> I liked the feeling of this big intervallic step. It, it kind of, it was a low thing becoming high really fast. And then I wanted to just echo it. And to me, that sounds like something kind of shocking and a little bit out there, a little bit like you'd experience with that kind of a tonality. It's something that kind of sounded a little bit like something ominous is coming and it's big. So I had this intro part. And then I thought I really wanted a question answer vibe to the riff. Uh, I, I wanted an answer to whether this was a question or a statement I needed an opposite, something that, that referred to it. So I kind of inverted it in my head. So I went from to and it was it just it just fell under my fingers to be really honest with you i wasn't thinking about a scale or a mode i was purely finding notes that sounded right and more often than not when i'm writing i'm not thinking about theory 
or scales or arpeggios or modes. I'm, I'm finding notes that feel right and I will use the theory after I've written something to further explore it and, and teach it to other people. So for example, the other guys in my band, you know, I'm talking to Rabia, I would say, yeah, then I do this and it's in this key and this mode and you go, okay, what about these this chord? And he'll know. So the theory is used to transport the concept and spread it around the other dudes. So, so far I got this. And then I thought, that sounds cool, but it's very busy. I need something that grounds it. I want the footstep of the giant. So I just went. And I really wanted that string to boom out and have that it's going away from pitch. So the pitch should be just, just that D note, but I want it to boom out to D sharp. Because to me, it sounds like a, a war horn, like there's big battle horns made from a mammoth tusk or something that they'd fire off. And it felt like it was part of the story. So, so far we've got this. And in this short piece of film, the army uh, advancing has uh, a bunch of musicians and they fire off a little kind of um, a fanfare, like an attack da -da 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 kind of vibe. And I imitate it. So it's like a little fanfare of the advancing army and it's just fifths doing its thing. So I incorporated it. And although it's a weird thing to do in the riff, it really works. And now I have this. And from there, it was simply a matter of just expanding it down the fretboard. That was it. I, I had described the scene in my head with music. When you write music to something that you are experiencing or have experienced, it's very difficult to forget it. So live, this riff falls under my hand so easily because it is just something that, you know, it came from an image. And because my lyrics come from the same place, I am describing somewhere I am in my head the lyrics form almost a story. I, I'm pretty much unaware of what they are when I'm writing them. They're just kind of coming through me like a, a catharsis. And then when I look at them, I think, oh, it's about that. You know, it was easy. I'll give you another example of a riff. This one was, was um, kind of pure chance, but I think it's an interesting uh, analogy anyway. So um, I, I, I was trying to come up with an exercise for picking and plucking for hybrid work. And I was thinking, oh, I wonder if I can pluck, pick, pluck, pick, just down the strings, like. And then do it the other way. Just to get some transport, just to move across the strings in a quick and effective way. And I did it up here. And then I, I showed Dave, the bassist in Dorje, and he, he was playing it too. And I, for a minute, I stopped looking at the shape and I listened to the notes that he was playing that I'd just come up with. And I thought, wait a minute, it's a wicked riff. And I'd written a riff and not realized it because I hadn't been listening to what I was playing. I had been experiencing the notes as purely an exercise and a shape. And if you just add a little bit of rhythm, you get this. And you have a riff. I'd had it the whole time, I hadn't realized, which I think highlights how important it is to listen to what you're playing, even if it's a mindless thing. You know, I know there's a lot of negative talk about noodling. Actually, I think noodling can be beneficial to the, the pure athletic, you know, qualities of your hand. And sometimes it's good to let your mind be free and not worry about where you are and what you're doing. You know, nobody wants to always be on all the time. It's fine to just noodle, but I think it's important to listen to what you're noodling about. <laughs> That's probably key. Try writing. 
It is a freeing, creative and fun experience and it's one that I really want you to share with your friends, your family, with me. Just get out there and write tunes and please whatever you do don't be afraid of releasing music. Don't write stockpile and, and then think oh it's not right I've got to tweak. Just get it out, release a tune, let people hate bits of it, let people love bits of it because I'm telling you now in a world with a billion people and they all have two ears mostly, they're all going to listen to something and you only need the tiniest fraction of a percentage of those people to even care about your music for you to have a career selling music and being involved in making a living as a musician and I'll talk about that in a chapter coming up.